Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. In this episode, Forever a Munchkin, I'll be speaking with Betty Ann Bruno. Betty Ann was just seven years old when she was chosen to play a resident of Munchkinland in one of my favorite movies, The Wizard of Oz, which was released in 1939. She is here today to share memories of the three weeks she spent on the set during the filming of that iconic movie. Additionally, she'll tell stories about her career as a television news reporter, the devastation she felt when she lost her home to the widespread Oakland, California firestorm in 1991, and finally, we'll hear about her love of hula dancing and what she is doing with that passion today. Betty Ann has lived a very interesting and accomplished life, which she tells about in her new book, The Munchkin Diary, My Personal Yellow Brick Road. And today, we will get a sneak peek of what's in that book. So now I'd like to welcome Betty Ann Bruno to our show. Welcome, Betty Ann. Thank you very much, James. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you. First of all, I want to tell you, Betty Ann, that I am excited like a kid right now because When I was little, I loved, and I still love The Wizard of Oz, but when I was a kid, we had to wait one year between watching The Wizard of Oz, and it was on, I think, around Easter time, once a year on television, Yes. and it was a Sunday night. All the kids in class, the Friday before, would be all a buzz for The Wizard of Oz coming on, and we were excited, and nothing happened on that Sunday night, except watching The Wizard of Oz. So I am tickled pink to have you on our show. Thank you very much. I'm still a munchkin. Aw. (laughs) (laughs) I want to start, Betty Ann, by asking you, where were you born and what do you know about your heritage? I was born in Hawaii. It was then a little town right in the middle of Oahu, the island where Honolulu is. It's called Wahiawa. And my mother was a school teacher there. My father was in the Signal Corps, stationed at Schofield Barracks, which is right next to Wahiwa. So they met, courted, and got married. They lived in Wahiwa initially and had my brother. 18 months later, I was born. And at that point, my father moved us to Pu'uloa and had it was a, a nice house on a peninsula and so on. My father's story is, I find, fascinating. He was born and grew up in Wichita Falls, Texas, a son of a dirt poor farmer in Wichita Falls. He didn't have two nickels to rub together when he grew up. As soon as he was old enough to join the army, it was his ticket out of Wichita Falls. His mother, my grandmother, after whom I'm named Betty, was a very devoted and strict uh, Nazarene. And she did not allow cards, dancing, movies, popular songs, gambling, you know, nothing allowed. So all of her sons went out behind the barn and became adept gamblers. My father, with a mind like a calculator, became an ace poker player because he could do the odds as the cards were revealed in the game. So he always won at poker. His younger brother, my uncle Ace, could control the dice. And as long as he didn't have to throw against the backboard, he could roll the dice and win all the time. So those two guys joined the army to get out of Wichita Falls, and they were stationed all over the Pacific. By the time they ended up in Hawaii, they were quite wealthy because every payday, they ended up with most of the company's money. (laughs) Uh, from their fellow soldiers who were just gambling. And so they owned most of the businesses around Schoolfield Barracks on the base, the camera shop, the pawn shop, barber shop, everything. They they owned that. So my father now had quite a bit of money and uh, he bought this wonderful property in Pu'uloa. So that was my, those are my early years. I have no recollection of living 
in Hawaii as a child because when I was three and a half, my father came to California, brought us to California. That was in 1934. Prohibition had just ended. And my father came to join his younger brother, my Uncle Ace, in the liquor business. My Uncle Ace had left Hawaii and left the Army in about 1929 or 30 and came to Hollywood and found a perfect place for a bootleg business. So I don't know if my father had money in that business or not, but they bought a huge building right across the street from 20th Century Fox Studios. I want to ask you one thing. Did your grandmother know anything about the bootlegging or the gambling? She did later on because after my grandfather died, she was dependent on her sons for a living. And she came and lived in Hollywood in an apartment that my Uncle Ace gave to her. They also took care of her allowance. And she, (laughs) Grandma, sat in her apartment and I think just prayed faster and more furiously than she had before for their souls. But there was never a discussion about it. There was never, you know, any scolding or anything. I mean, she had no power anymore. It was an interesting juxtaposition, you might say. (laughs) Of two worlds, yeah. So now you're in California, and at what age did you come to California? Yeah, I was three and a half when my mother brought me over. My father had come a year earlier to help and set up the business. So he bought, at that point, they could do a liquor business legally. So the bootleg place that had ostensibly, on the face of it, was an auto repair company with a long driveway into a great big room where they supposedly did the auto repair, but which actually was full of cases of whiskey, uh, bootleg whiskey. My Uncle Ace paid off the local police periodically, so they would tell him about raids that were about to happen, so he was able to remove enough cases of whiskey so that most of his inventory was safe, and he'd leave a few cases for the police to take home and enjoy. Sounds like an Elliot Ness movie, doesn't it? (laughs) It really was. It really was. And then there was a little uh, restaurant right next to that auto repair place. When my father came to Hollywood, he turned that into a liquor store. So the Volstead Act ended. Liquor store, Jim Cane Liquors, right next door to Ace Cane's Cafe, which was in a slightly racy nightclub. It was very successful. Both businesses were very successful because the movie folks from across the street and up the block all could come there after work and enjoy a relaxing evening. And Uncle Ace had three nightly floor shows and in a corner, a Hawaiian theme. So my mother, after she got here, she had a beautiful lyric soprano voice. And once in a while, she would sing at my Uncle Ace's cafe. But mostly, my mother spent time keeping my brother and me out of Uncle Ace's cafe. It wasn't an appropriate place for children, obviously. Yeah, it wasn't a place she wanted you running around in. So I just want to go back a little bit. Your mom, your dad met your mom in Hawaii. Yes. What was your mother's background? Was she 100% Hawaiian? Well, she told us she was. She was a, a native speaker because she was raised by her grandparents. They died when she was quite young. So then her great aunt and uncle, all of whom were Hawaiian. So she was raised as a full-blooded Hawaiian, and that's what she really believed she was. What she found out as a teenager, that her mother was the person she had been told to call Auntie Rose, and that she had other brothers and sisters. Turned out she was the oldest of 10 kids, and she didn't really know they were her brothers and sisters. She thought they were her cousins, so she didn't really, she wasn't close to her biological family her immediate family. She was really taught to disparage Chinese men. She taught that to us. So I was really taught to distrust Chinese men, all Chinese, but especially Chinese men. When I was 21 years old, I wrote to Hawaii for my birth certificate because my parents gave me a trip to Europe as a graduation present from college. I had to have a birth certificate to get my passport. Birth certificate came and it said, father, Caucasian, mother, Chinese, Hawaiian. I confronted her about that and I said, it says here, father, Caucasian, mother, Chinese, Hawaiian. And I said, you've always told us you were full-blooded Hawaiian and we didn't have any Chinese blood. And she said, oh, that. Well, you don't have any Chinese blood. I kept it all. It was sad. It was really, 
it was one of the big, really sad things in my life that I had to work out. The acceptance of my true biological heritage because I had to accept who I was. Of course you did. And it was sad that she didn't do that. She did ultimately. I mean, I think that was a changing point in her life too, because when she was in her early 70s or late 60s, she and I went to China together for three weeks. Did you? She had a wonderful time in China. And the Chinese people made a big fuss over her. It was in the 80s, early 80s, when travel to China first opened up. So people were still wearing Mao jackets and it was a closed, very closed society. They gave tourists special money to spend. You, you could only spend it at certain government stores and so on, very controlled. But my mother was the center of attention wherever she went and she loved that. Oh, <laughs> so I that bet. That's really good. Yeah. Did she ever say why she didn't want to be known as Chinese or you known as Chinese? She, she wouldn't talk about it. I really wanted her to talk to me about her background and what her childhood was like. The only story she told me about her childhood was the time that her grandmother took her to the volcano and they spent overnight and the, her grandmother chanted and had my mother throw olelo berries into the pit. So my mother didn't go into that in very much detail, but I think she felt, and I think it was too, a dedication of her loyalty, as it were, to the Hawaiian gods and to Pele particularly. Got it. I wanted to go back to Hollywood again. Yes. And ask you, how was it living across the street from these Hollywood studios back in the 1930s? That must have been amazing, even though it's a, you were very young at the time. What do you remember about it? Well, the studios themselves were not interesting to me because I never got inside 20th Century Fox Studio. There was just a big wall across the street, two blocks across the street from where we lived and one block on the same side of, of Western Avenue, clear up to sunset. And then there was my uncle's cafe with three nightly floor shows. My brother and I took dancing and singing lessons. We thought everybody, every kid in Hollywood sang and danced and was in the movies. So everybody we knew pretty much was auditioning or showing up for some kind of class. I mean, everything was entertainment business. So it was very natural to have that. We lived in a duplex right next door to my father's liquor store, which was right next door to my Uncle Ace's cafe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where it's all happening there. It's all so happening there. That was our neighborhood. The other side of our duplex was a 76 gas station. And that was the whole block. And... You know, a lot of people would think what a terrible environment for young children. And it probably was in a way, but my mother was very, both my parents were very protective of my brother and me. Uh, we were only allowed in the back part of my father's liquor store, and we were not allowed at all in Uncle Ace's cafe, except on special occasions when the eight o'clock floor show featured a cowboy, a magician, uh, a puppeteer or something that they thought was appropriate for young children. And then we would have a front row table, especially every time an entertainer came with a horse and brought a live horse to the nightclub. And that happened, that would happen maybe once every few months. And I always got to see that. And the horse was always asked if he wanted to give anybody in the audience a ride. And the horse would always pick me. <laughs> Love it. I love it. Those were the high points of my life. When I was a little girl, I used to dream about having a horse. Oh, I wanted a horse so, so badly. In those days, there were pony rides around Los Angeles and Hollywood. And for 10 cents, you'd get strapped into a saddle on a little pony and you could ride around the ring a couple of times. And I, whenever I saw one, I would just beg my parents to please stop, please, please, please. So I think they probably drove around many blocks to avoid passing the pony rides whenever we had some place to go in Hollywood. But I, I wanted a horse so badly. I got to make a note here that this is the middle of the Great Depression. Yes, exactly. It sounded like your dad and your family were doing pretty well, considering it was the Great Depression because their business was successful. Is that a true Statement? Yes, yes. My father was a very good businessman. We did not live a high life 
We lived a very simple life, very frugal, my parents. I didn't have a lot of toys. Our luxury, I think, were really the dancing and singing lessons. So we had a lot of glamorous people in our lives, singers and actors and you know, musicians and so on. I felt it was very, very colorful, especially the, the characters at my Uncle Ace's Cafe, which I do write about in the book. <laughs> yes, we're going to talk about the book a little yes. later, too. Uh, anyway, so tell us how you first got introduced to being in the movies. The dancing and singing studios would have bulletin boards and post auditions for children's parts in all the films. So, I mean, that was Hollywood, and that's what people did. And the all the mothers would pour over the bulletin board and see, you know, what was available. The first movie I was in, I think I was either four and a half or five, and that was Hurricane at Dorothy L'Amour and John Hall. And, you know, that film is still available on cable television today, and it still holds up. John Ford was director of that film. Everything was right there in, filmed right there in Hollywood around a big reservoir that looked like the ocean or, but it was, Hollywood was in love with Hawaii and all things Polynesian in those days. So there were a lot of movies in Hawaii and, you know, supposedly in Hawaii. So my brother and I got lots of a little, it just says extras, nothing very big and nothing that has survived today except Hurricane a little bit and the most famous movie on the whole globe. The Wizard of Oz, my favorite. So how did all that roll out for you? And what do you remember from that time? The audition call was for little girls under four and a half feet tall who could sing, dance, and act terrified. So I was very short, went to the audition, made the cut. I had read The Wizard of Oz. That was the first book that I ever owned. An aunt gave that to me when I was five, and I learned to read out of that book. So I knew that story, but I didn't, for some reason, put that book together with the dancing and singing we were doing. There were 12 little girls hired to fill in the back of the crowds of the Munchkin Village, because although they had 124, they called themselves midgets, now they're called little people. There were 124 of them. The director, Fleming, wanted a few more bodies in the background and so uh, he had 12 of us little girls hired to fill in the background so we have poured over that film frame by frame looking for me can't find me i am there but they did not want to see children's faces as part of the munchkin village they wanted adult faces so the call uh, to the stage to shoot was always okay on the set in your places Take your places. Kids in the back. Kids in the back. <laughs> Kids in the back. That was such a common call that the first time, years, many years later, when I met some of the midgets again, we were in New York to be on the Maury Povich show. I walked into the green room, and I hadn't met any of the midgets before. I walked into the green room. They're there. I, I introduced myself, and one of them looked up and said, oh, yeah, one of the kids in the back. <laughs> I mean, that was after, what, 50 years or something. It's crazy. Yeah. So always in the back. But it was so wonderful, James, to be on that set. As you said, it was the middle of the Depression. We were not poor, but we lived in a very economical way. I didn't have a lot of toys. There were no Disneylands. There were no wonderful parks that were all in color. There was no Technicolor. When we went to the movies, the movies were black and white. Yeah. So life was pretty simple and not much color. So after a week or so, we were fitted with costumes and we were taken to the set. And when I walked into that set and saw all those colorful plastic flowers, huge, the yellow brick road, the fountain in the center, I just couldn't believe my eyes. And then seeing the other munchkins, adults, who were shorter, some of whom were shorter than I was, that was really unbelievable. I had always been the shortest person in my class. And I saw these adults who, some of whom were, I would kind of sidle up to them, you know, if I saw one that I thought might be shorter than I was, and I'd go, yeah, look how tall I am. Shorter than I am. And that was ecstasy. I mean, I was just in hog heaven, as it were. <laughs> so, Betty Ann, what do you remember about 
the shooting of the Wizard of Oz and your parts and you being on the stage and interacting with other characters? Who, who else did you see or what did you see while you were on the set? The only other character stars of the movie who were on the set when I was there, the Munchkin set, was Billy Burke as the Good Witch, Margaret Hamilton as the Dead Witch's sister, and Margaret Hamilton, you know, had her immolation scene. She disappears into a trap door, and she was badly burned. We all remember that was horrible. It was the quick thinking of somebody else on the set who got some water on her face and stopped her from being injured even more than she was. That was really awful. Were you on the set when that happened? Oh, yes. I was part of all the shooting of the Munchkin Village. The whole gig for The Wizard of Oz for me lasted three weeks. So I remember practicing, learning the steps, learning how to dance up the steps across and down the other and sing the song. I were off to see the wizard. You had to learn that little skippy dance. Judy Garland, of course, was also there. And that was, I do remember that. There was a, a rumor that Judy Garland was giving out autographed pictures of herself to some of the munchkins. So I wanted one. I had an autographed book, but I wanted, oh, a picture? Oh my goodness. That was me. So you had to go to her trailer, which was the other side of this huge building set. And the whole Munchkin village was there. And then away from that was dark and cold and, you know, where the, the children, we were kept segregated from the adults. We had to go to school when we were not working on the set. We had our own teacher and there was a little classroom. And that was about it. And Judy Garland had a trailer at the other end across lots of cords and props and dark and cold and I wanted my mother to go with me she wouldn't go with me I, she, I guess she thought it'd be a character building exercise for me to do that trip by myself <laughs> so I went and it was really like going into a spooky forest for me I mean I I did it because I really wanted that autograph picture knocked on Judy Garland's trailer's door she came to the door and she's standing you know up in the trailer I'm down on the floor she looks down at me with her big eyes and says I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures today. Come back tomorrow. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Okay. I made that trip every day that we were on the set. Every day she said the same thing. Come back tomorrow. I never got a picture. And you were how old at this point, Betty Ann? I had just turned seven in October. The Munchkin Village set was shot in November. The scene that you were in, what year was it? The Munchkin Village set was shot in November of 1938. I had just turned seven the month before. So when you're seven years old and you're being told to wait till tomorrow, it might as well be an eternity, right? You're not kidding. Yes, very long time. And it never came. <laughs> oh, you never got it. But she seemed very nice, did she? Well, yes, that was my only direct contact with her. Afterwards, it came out that she probably didn't have any pictures. I mean, I believe that she was telling the truth. Yeah, she was 16 years old. She's just so talented, so talented. One other question about The Wizard of Oz. You can keep on going as far as I'm concerned, but I did want to ask you about the flying monkeys. Practicing? The flying monkeys used to practice in the building across the street or, you know, just very close by. And my mother, she always brought lunch for us. And we would go to the flying monkey set and have lunch and watch the aerialists just they would do touch and goes i mean what a treat that was how many little kids get to watch aerialists practice their touch and goes while they're having their brown bag lunch it was good wow was good. talented acrobats <laughs> yeah but they weren't in their costumes at the time no 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 they weren't in their costumes but it was still exciting to me i loved that the other stars, they all came to the Munchkin set to visit, and we got all their autographs. I got everybody else's autograph except Judy Garland's. But, oh, you want to hear the sequel to the story? Yes, I'd love to hear that. Last year in my hula class, my dancers, we always have a Christmas party, and everybody dances. And Anyway, they gave me a bunch of presents, including a pair of ruby slippers, and an autographed copy of a picture of Judy Garland. Oh, bingo, finally. No, I think they forged the autograph. <laughs> they, <just, laughs> well, they bought it on eBay or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> it only so took I, 82 years, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> 
Wow, that's fantastic. So I've been reading your book and I know you eventually left Hollywood. What did you do then? Where did you go? We left Hollywood because my father had a lung a disease. I don't know what it was. I don't. It was. I don't think it was TB, but I, I don't know what it was. But his doctor told him to get out of Hollywood, get out of the Los Angeles basin, because the air was bad for him. The word smog had not been invented yet. This was 1939. I was eight years old. The doctor told him, "Get out of town. Go to the desert. Go to Palm Springs or someplace out there where there's clean air." So we went one day to look at opportunities for business and homing and stuff. And it was 120 degrees. That kind of eliminated Palm Springs. <laughs> oh. Yeah, on the way back, this was probably in June 1939. And so on the way back to Los Angeles, we passed a beautiful agricultural valley. It was the Hemet San Jacinto Valley. The fruit trees were in full bloom. My father went to a realtor there. They showed us a Turkey Ranch was awful. My father, you know, had lived on a little farm in Wichita Falls, Texas. So he was really attracted to returning to life on a farm. After they rejected the turkey farm, they showed us a 10-acre farm that had four acres of apricot trees, about 30 other kinds of fruit trees, uh, figs and plums, pears and peaches and and a pasture in the back. There was a barn with horses and cows, and there were chickens there. My parents just absolutely fell in love with the place. They couldn't go in the house because the farmer and his wife were not home. The house was locked, so they didn't go in the house. But the house was there. They could see it looked fine, and they just, you know, assumed it was had everything that every, every other house did. So they, my father bought the place cash. Well, he said cash on the barrel head. I think it might have cost like three thousand dollars or so. I, I don't know. And it was. <laughs> That was it. Fell in love with the place. We moved out there when school was out, and we arrived there at night. It was 8 or 9 o'clock at night. It was dark, and the farm was down a dirt road in the country. Got there, and of course, everybody had to go to the bathroom. Ran in the house. <laughs> no bathroom. No. No. I mean, there was a room next to the kitchen. Had a bathtub in it, but as it turned out, the bathtub wasn't hooked up to anything. If you wanted to take a bath, you had to fill it with buckets of hot water, pots of hot water. And then it drained into the grape arbor, which was on the other side of the wall, outside the house. They had seen an outhouse by the barn when they looked at the grounds, of course, when they bought the place. And they just thought that was, well, every farm had an outhouse for farm hands. And, you know, when you were outside, you'd want to go all the way back to the house. The only running water in the house was the kitchen sink. It was gravity feed from a tank house that was just outside in the yard, and to filter out and make the water clean, there was a flour sack tied to the faucet, and that was our water filter. What a horrible surprise. <laughs> Not a pleasant surprise at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. The first thing that they did, the first improvement to the farm, was to get some people out there to dig a cesspool and put some plumbing in, and, and it became very wonderful. We lived there for until I was 13 years old. Those years on the farm were very wonderful years. I bet they were. Betty Ann, before we talk about the next stage in your life, can we step back a little to your days in Hollywood? I'd love to hear about an important person in your life who you talk about in your book, who you called Auntie Bertie. Auntie Bertie was not a relative, but everybody in town called her Auntie Bertie. I felt she was more of an auntie to me than a lot of other people who were, you know, related. Auntie Bertie was in the movies, like everybody in Hollywood was. She lived in the other half of the duplex. When she was there, we unlocked the door between our two apartments, and Auntie Bertie was so much a part of the family. I loved to be around her. She was an immense woman. She was as wide as she was tall, and she could only wear moos that were made for her, like big tent-like dresses. She had bunions. If you describe her, she would sound really unattractive, but there was something very lovely about Auntie Bertie. She was a, a beautiful soul. She was an incredible businesswoman. She catered luau's for all of the Hollywood elite. And of course, as I said earlier, Hollywood was in love with Hawaii, so a lot of Hollywood 
type celebrities love to have luau's for their birthday parties and other celebrations, and my Auntie Bertie would cater them. She also got the poi for every Hawaiian in Southern California. She had a lock on that product, and I remember her getting 20-pound bags of poi. I would hang out with Auntie Bertie whenever I had a chance, so I was at her, in her part of the apartment a lot uh, as a kid. Whenever she got poi, the 20-pound bags frozen came in from the ship, she would chop it up and she'd have to cook it, boil it, make it soft and nice to eat. And then she would strain it, put it in a big cheesecloth and she would squeeze, squeeze, squeeze and the poi would fall out into the bowl all nice and strained, ready to eat. I love being around her. She was very, very Hawaiian. I spoke Hawaiian to all of her friends. She did all of her business over her black dial telephone from her dining room table and she would coo into the phone almost. She'd call up somebody. She, I mean, she couldn't do much work herself, physical work. Poi was the only thing I ever saw her make. But she would call up somebody. She needed an errand run. Call up, Ene, can you, for Auntie, do something for Auntie? She referred to herself in the third person. Powerful person. People would just run to the end of the earth for her. I loved it whenever she asked me to do something. I mean, sometimes she would ask me to dance because I knew about three hulas. She would ask me to dance at her luau's and I would go and hang out, sell lays for her. She also made crepe paper lays. They were all over her house, all these colorful crepe paper lays hanging there. She made them by the dozens, by the hundreds. I don't know, they were everywhere. So going to her house was just a treat. Wow. It was my trip to Hawaii because my mother did her very best to, quote, protect us from our ethnic heritage. That was the period of time that I grew up in. I'm sorry, the protect us is in quotation marks. Yes. So my mother did her best to, quote, protect us, unquote, from our ethnic heritage. It was in the 30s and 40s, it was not cool to be ethnic. Everybody wanted to be part of the melting pot. That was the big dream in the United States of America, to be the melting pot and to melt in and melt away all your ethnic background and behaviors and practices. Well, you can melt if you're white. You cannot melt if you have brown skin or almond eyes or kinky hair. So I grew up thinking that I was melting. But when I got to college, I found out that I hadn't melted, that people wanted to know where I was from. And they would ask me, they say, where are you from? And I'd say, I'm from Hammett, California, Hammett, San Jacinto. No, no, where are you really from? And then I would have to admit that I was born in Hawaii. And then they'd want to know, oh, do you know so-and-so? Do you do that and that and that and that and that? And I didn't know any. I had no background for that. So I was very, I was very guarded about telling people I was part Hawaiian. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's something I know must have been very difficult for you at the time to you know, go from your mother protecting you to you wanting to know really more about your ethnic background. I wanted to know more about it, and I would ask my mother often to tell me more about that. It was something she wanted to forget. It was only when I was 21 that I found I was part Chinese, too. So not only was I, I had the Hawaiian part of me that I didn't know anything about, but I had the Chinese part of me that I really didn't know anything about. I went to college at Stanford, and there are a lot of kids from Hawaii who go to Stanford. Most of them are graduates of Punahou, the private high school in Honolulu. So all these Howley kids, blonde, blue-eyed, they could all play the ukulele, dance the hula, speak pigeon, knew all about traveling in the islands, everything. I knew zip. Well, I knew about two or three hulas. That was about it. But I didn't know the real cool hulas that they knew. I knew lovely hula hands and little brown gal. And they knew all these hulas that were actually had Hawaiian lyrics to the songs. So I felt very displaced and very defensive. It was not a happy time. People kept asking me, you know, every time I'd meet somebody new, they'd want to know where I was from, and where I was really from. So it was difficult. So Betty Ann, you mentioned that you went to Stanford. What did you major in when you were at that school? I majored in political science. What I wanted to do after college was to be in city government. And my long range goal was to become a city manager at some point. I really wanted to make government work for people. I was very devoted to that. Well, when I graduated, one of my professors 
recommended me to a recruiter for the CIA. And he came and interviewed me on graduation day. Then I went to Washington and took a test for a junior officer training program, which sounded wonderful. Again, going to Washington, D.C. was like going to paradise, right? So I moved to Washington after my trip to Europe. It was the 50s, 1953, I graduated from college. The junior officer training program slots, I was told, were all filled. There wasn't an opening for me right then, but I could be a, I could come in after my clearance and work as a secretary. And then when an opening came in the junior officer training program, I could just move right into that. That never happened. What I learned was a lot of other secretaries were told the same thing I was. But it was still a glorious time for me. I loved living in Washington, D.C. And working for the government was really kind of a wonderful experience for me. I did graduate work at George Washington University in political science. So then I met the man <laughs> I married, Russ Bruno, my first husband. We were married for 21 years. During that first year we were married, he decided he wanted to become a lawyer. He also worked at the agency, but we left the agency. We left Washington, D.C. and moved to Berkeley. He went to UC Berkeley and became a lawyer. I decided that I had to deal with my ethnic identity, and I was happy to be back in California, especially the Bay Area, because I knew there were a lot of Hawaiians here. I thought I could, I could become acquainted with my Hawaiian self through the hula, because I loved to dance. So I sought and found the most wonderful hula teacher, and her name was Ida Wong Gonzalez. She was the premier teacher and uh, leader of Hawaiian shows, producer of Hawaiian shows in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s here in the Bay Area. And I danced with her for about 15 years and she became my Hawaiian mother. She was Chinese Hawaiian, the same as my own mother. Yeah. But Ida was comfortable in her own skin, unlike my mother. Nice. So just being around Ida, she wrapped me into her family immediately. And without teaching me outright, she taught me how to be comfortable in my skin. And uh, so I, I love that. That became a very big part of my life. But the interest in political science was always there. So after my second child was a year old, I joined the League of Women Voters and kept a promise to myself that when Michael was one year old, I would expand my horizons beyond the nursery. I ended up running for office in 1971. I ran against a 12-year incumbent. I didn't win, but I didn't lose by very much. But I went into a kind of funk after the election. And one of the things I did as president of the League of Women Voters was to a coalition of community activists to the local television station to ask them to do more political programming. So this was the late 60s. There were a lot of issues, as we all, you know, at a certain age remember. And one of them was getting... More, more public debate about those issues that were going on. And the stations at that point, none of the radio stations or television stations in the country were doing much about that. But they became part of that whole movement because they knew there was a lot of interest in political issues. After I lost the election for city council, a few months later, Channel 2 offered me a job of producing political shows for them, doing their election shows and a public debate show, which I had helped lobby to get on the air a couple years earlier. That was like, hey, would you like to get paid for something you've been doing as a volunteer? Yes. <laughs> I'm very excited. I was so excited I couldn't sleep. Or when they first <laughs> offered me that job, I said, you know, I don't know anything about television. And the station manager and the head of community affairs looked at me and said, we know what you know. You've been popping in and out of this station for the last couple of years telling us what we ought to do. We want what you know on our staff. Can you be here Monday morning at nine? Yes. <laughs> it was amazing. And I loved everything about that job. And I felt so blessed having that opportunity. So I was in community affairs as a producer that produced that debate show that we lobbied to get on the air. And then about six months later, they gave me my own show. It's a magazine show that I produced and hosted. The news anchor who had been moderating the debate show decided he didn't want to do it anymore, so I began hosting that show. So I was producing and hosting two one-hour shows every week and, and getting paid for it. I just 
couldn't believe that life could be so good. Isn't it funny sometimes that when we find something that we love, we're almost surprised that we get paid for it? Yes. So then, after five years of that, the news director asked me if I had ever thought about being a news reporter, going to the news department. And I said, no, why should I? I produce and host two hours every week, and I love what I do, and you guys spend maybe 90 seconds on a story. Why would I want to do news? And he, he looked at me and kind of laughed, and he said, because you are now a single mom. My husband and I had separated. And uh, he said, you are now a single mom. You have three kids, and news pays twice as much as community affairs. Nice. So I was there. And I stayed with the news department until I retired in 1992. Wow. Now, in your book, you tell about a pretty scary event that happened to you with some threats that came your way. Is there? Can you give us a little snippet of that? One of the series of stories I did was with a local drug lord. He was the head of the Holly Rock Gang, known for its violence and terror. But he had a candy apple red Cadillac that we did the interview in, and we rode with him for a couple of days. Craig was the cameraman for that story. And Craig is your husband. My husband, yes, we met in the news. He got me through my first day in the news. The joke is I married him out of gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together for, what, 44 years now, so. Uh, your husband's a delightful person to talk with, that's for sure. We're a team. That was it. We've always been a really good team. So we did this story with this guy, Holly Rock. And then the last day that we did the shooting was my last day before a a three-week vacation in Tahiti. So I left. The next day, we went to Tahiti, had the best vacation I've ever had in my whole life. Came back, and my desk is piled high with notes that Holly Rock had called. His name was... Holloway, actually, his gang was Holly Rock, that he'd call he was not happy. He said that one of the police officers who was part of the series too, that I had told the policeman to go out and arrest him. I hadn't, of course, but he didn't believe me and he threatened me. And he said, you're uh, called me a not nice name. He says, I'm gonna get you. Oh. And he hung up. That was pretty terrifying because his gang was known for violence and murder. So I didn't know what to do. They let me park my car in in a locked cage every day for several months after that. That's terrifying, Betty Ann. You must have been scared to death. Well, I was, and I called the police officer who had arrested him, and I said, you know, he's threatened me now. And the police officer said, "Uh, don't pay any, he's all talk. Don't pay any attention to that. Fine for him to say that. I mean, he's got his guns and his bulletproof vest and (laughs) all that stuff and... But you didn't have all those things. <laughs> oh, I didn't have all those things. <laughs> Not too reassuring. <laughs> he's, all, he's all talk, right? Yeah, I didn't. You know, there was something about the streets, though, in those days. It was the 80s. They're not like the streets today. And I think a lot of us news reporters and news people felt that we were kind of immune from the violence. We were separated from it. We'd had a couple of bottles thrown at us when we worked in the ghetto. That was kind of one of my beats was City Hall, the state capitol, and the ghetto. (laughs) The themes of my stories, I really like to dig up stories about the use and abuse of power. And that goes back to my political science background. That was important to me. So that's where it happens. The use and abuse of power, ghetto, state capitol, city hall. (laughs) Well, we're so glad that you are safe and sound. Me too. But speaking of safe and sound, there's a story in your book that you tell about a fire that took place back in, I think it was 1991. Can you tell us about that? In October 91, uh, Craig and I were on vacation. we just come in from one week out on the base. We had a sailboat at the time. It was our weekend. We were going up to sail on the Delta for the second week. On a Saturday, we were out on the bay. There was no wind, so we motored all around the bay, and Craig noticed a curl of smoke going up from the one of the hills. He said, oh, there's a fire up there in the, in the East Bay. Looks like it's just up from Berkeley. He said, good thing there's no wind today. Firefighters got the fire out under control. The next day, Sunday, 
the firefighters were up there hosing the stumps of the trees that had burned the day before. Two acres had burned on that Saturday. And one of our reporters was up there talking to the fire chief in charge of this cleanup. And the fire chief said, it's a good thing there's no wind because if the wind were to kick up and one of these sparks were to go into one of those pine trees, we would have a fire that would not stop until it got to the bay. 30 minutes later, that is exactly what happened. The winds kicked up, got 60 miles an hour, fire just blew out of control. It was the worst urban firestorm in the history of the United States. 3,000 homes burned, 25 people died that day. Oh boy. It was horrendous. Our house was five miles away from where the fire started. So Craig had gone to buy some equipment and stuff for our second week of sailing vacation. And he called, he, he could see the fire kicking up and he said, you want me to come home? You know, I said, no, no, I, I just called the newsroom and they said, everything's under control. Everything is fine. I'm fine. It's five miles away. You don't have to bother. I had a friend who lived in an apartment house that was close to where the fire was. And I thought, oh, and I heard on the news that the fire had gone to the Parkwoods apartments. I called her to say, come to our house where you'll be safe. Sure. All I got was a busy signal. I thought she was on the line, but what I learned later is that when the lines are dead, you get a busy signal. Then I went outside and looked. I could see the neighbors who lived on the next street up the hill. They lived at the crest of the hill. We lived on a street one block down from the crest. All the people from that street were driving down past our house. And I thought, they're all going to go look at the fire. What a bunch of voyeurs. I didn't realize that the fire had jumped an eight lane freeway had come down the hill into the park that was on our side of the freeway up the side of the hill and all those neighbors were running for their lives my goodness oh so i started to return a call our producer had called to find out if we were okay i started to call him back and i heard a neighbor yell betty ann betty ann your house is on fire your roof is on fire how awful and i thought oh my god so i ran up got on the roof I have acrophobia. I don't go on roofs, but got on the roof, tried to put out the fire. A young man appeared from nowhere. He's up on the roof and he said, get get some crowbars. Let's get rid of these shingles. The house was burning. He said, bring, you know, get the hose. I got two hoses up there, the crowbars, but we couldn't, we couldn't save the house. It roared. I mean, uh, if anybody's been near a firestorm, it roars like you're standing in front of a jet engine. It drowns out all other sound. But I did become aware of some voices yelling and I turned around and looked toward the street in front of our house and there was a group of firemen and they're saying, lady, lady, get off the roof, get out of here, get away. And I could see the entire block across the street was aflame and I, and I ran down, went through the house, spent about five minutes picking up stuff to save. It was all dumb stuff. Everything was too big or too heavy or too silly to take. So I got in the car, pushed the button to open the garage door, nothing, because of course we had no electricity. And then I thought, I sat there, this is really silly. I sat there, put a car in reverse, and I thought, I'm gonna be like Batman and just crash my way out of this garage. Batman, I mean, isn't that stupid to think of? I was gonna be Batman, here I am, what, 60 something years? (laughs) 60 60 year old woman thinking she's gonna be Batman. Then I thought, I can't do that because I knew the garage door had these metal rods that crossed, metal rods supporting it. Can't do that. It'll scratch the car. (laughs) (laughs) For bed. (laughs) Right. So I turned the engine off and tried manually to open the garage door, but I I didn't know that you had to pull the little red string. Oh, to disengage the garage door opener. Right. I didn't know that. So I pushed and pushed and wrestled with the garage door a little bit, didn't budge. So I ran next door. I knew that my neighbor was hosing his house down. So I ran next door to him. He came, my, he knew about the little red string, so he opened the garage door and I was able to leave. I went down to a, the next intersection, one block away, stood there and watched the fire consume our house. Oh, what a terrible sight that it was. It was, yeah, it was horrible. It was horrible. Yeah. I've heard about other people who've lost their homes in fires and also people who've had their homes burglarized. There's a terrible personal pain 
that you feel when that happens? I can only imagine it must have been very difficult for you. It was awful standing there watching my home burn. I had lived there for 30 years. My three sons had been born and raised there. It was the only home they knew. It was our family place, and it had contained everything, all the symbols of our memories, everything. And everything was gone, everything. I remember that the producer had just called me before then, and I and they lived right down the hill, about five blocks away. So, and I knew that Craig and I would find each other through the station somehow. So I drove down to their house, Earl's and Peggy's house. I was just numb. I was probably in shock, but I got down there and they said, well, you can either go inside the house and rest, or you can come with us. And we were up on the roof of the house across the street, the apartment house across the street. So I went with them and I just hunkered down next to a chimney or something and just sat there with my head on my knees and just numbed out. And then a few minutes later, I was aware of voices and it was Earl asking me if I could talk. What they did was set up a live shot because they had a view of the hills that were on fire. That was two o'clock that day and they wanted me to be interviewed. So, I mean, I didn't want to do it, but I thought of all the people I had interviewed over my years as a reporter, other people in difficult times who probably didn't want to talk to me. And I thought, I have to do this. So I did it. Wow, that's a lot of courage. But I was still in shock. So I was no emotion. I mean, I didn't cry until later. The reaction that people had to my interview was that, oh, you were so calm. I wasn't calm. I was just numb. You're in shock. Yeah. But that interview was picked up by CNN and went all around the world. And it was the first interview out of the fire. Uh, Oakland Fire Department at that moment put out the official word that 40 houses had burned. And that's what the reporter, Faith Fancher, said to me. Well, they say about 40 houses had burned. And I said, no, it's maybe 400. My whole neighborhood is gone. Later on, I'd run into some, a friend who would say, I was in Chicago then and saw that, and I knew that, you know, or I was in Bangkok, or I was in Japan, or all, all around the world, watching the CNN uh, report. So ours was the first report that went out, and I was the first survivor. Your voice was really the voice of all those people who had their homes burned. Right. Yeah. That was a Sunday. So we could not go up to the fire site the next day, they wouldn't let anybody go up. But Tuesday, they did let a crew, a news crew from our station go up. Craig and I agreed to go with them. So we went up to our house and went through the ruins of our house. And that was that was hard. Sorry. Well, that must have been very hard. Betty Ann, let's talk about something happier. Okay. To cheer us up. And I know it makes you happy and it yes. makes me happy reading about it. In your book, you've got a chapter called The Who in Hula. The Who in the Hula. The Who in the Hula. Now, you've talked already about your interest in dancing, that you had some dancing as a child before when you were trying out for the Wizard of Oz. And before that, you did it because it was fun and your mom and dad wanted you to do it. But tell us about this chapter in your book. The Hula was my entree, was my pathway to my identity, to finding out who I am. As I mentioned before, as soon as we moved to Berkeley, I was in my 20s, my husband was going to law school. I sought out the hula, someone to teach the hula to me. That was my way of finding out what it meant to be Hawaiian. So I danced with Ida Wong Gonzalez. Namanu, namanu o kava'a, the birds on the canoe. Namanu Okava'a, and she was a wonderful dancer, so graceful and beautiful, and just a beautiful person. I learned from her to be comfortable in my skin, to be comfortable with my face. That was a life-changing thing for me. But I still had this political science thing that I, I became a news reporter. And the busier I got with my politics, the less I could dance. So I didn't dance for about 30 years. And when I retired from Channel 2, and it took about five years to decompress and get, you know, saving the world out of my head, mm -hmm. 
I decided to return to the hula. Well, at that point, I'd forgotten just about everything. Ida had died. The fire had destroyed all the records, phone numbers, everything of anybody I'd ever danced with. I didn't have any costumes. I didn't have any choreography. I didn't have anything except this desire to learn to dance again. So I got in touch with Ida's grandson, whom she had raised. And over a period of years, after he got married, had a daughter, invited me and a couple of other students of Ida's to the christening of his daughter. And it was then that I was able to reconnect with Ida's choreography and stuff because they had all the papers, all the choreography, and they shared them with me. And I was able to get back into the hula again. A year later, I founded Hula Mai. I was just going to do a little workshop because I, I wanted to find other people in Sonoma who danced hula. So I thought, well, if I do this little workshop at the senior center here, I can meet other people who do the hula. Well, they didn't want to do a weekend workshop. They wanted to do a six-week workshop. So I did that six Fridays in a row. Had 18 students, had hula mai, and we did a little show at the end of that. And then nobody wanted to stop. So that was in 2009. This is now 2021. And hula mai is the core of not only my life, but Craig's life too. We have a full-blown performance company that we do shows all over the Bay Area. I teach for other hula conferences. Hula is the center of my life now, and I owe it all to that day. And whatever comes along in the way of hula, I say yes to. Oh, it connects you with your heritage as well. It absolutely does. And I have been so enriched for these last many years through the hula. We go to Hawaii, to world hula conferences, to learn from other teachers. I take the money that we earn in hula mai from doing shows, and I put that to giving back to my students through workshops. I will bring every year, not COVID years, but I have been able to bring a couple of master teachers from the islands over here to do special workshops for my students with money that they earn through the shows that we do. It's very, very wonderful. I've learned some more words than in addition to the five that my mother taught me when I was growing up. I wish I were fluent in the language. Uh, I am not, but I love the dance and now feel Hawaiian. It's all through the hula. I do Ida's uh, signature dance. It's all about love in family. The dance is Kavohi Kapulani is the name of it. It was written by Helen Deshea Beamer for her daughter, telling her daughter how much of a treasure the daughter was. And so when I do that dance, Ida is right there next to me. It's a very important and meaningful dance to me. And so Ida is the who in the hula. Oh, I love that. I love that. And not to mention that there are fitness benefits to hula as well, I would imagine. Yes. Well, there, is a, there are a couple benefits. My mother had given me a Hawaiian name when I was a child, but I never used it. I am now using that name. That name is Ka'ihilani, and it means the sacred heavens. I use it as part of hula mai. I introduce myself. I am not just Betty Ann Bruno, but I am Betty Ann Ka'ihilani Bruno now. Okay. It's really important to me. For women of a certain age, I mean, I started teaching at the Vintage House, which is the senior center. Of course, this is wine country, so you'd call the senior center here the Vintage House. Get it? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Women of a certain age have some issues with life. Their kids have grown and left the house. Uh, many of them, they're widows or they're divorced, so they're alone and they're not working anymore. They're retired from their jobs, careers. So what do they do? Well, they can play bingo. They learn to play bridge, a lot of that, mahjong, or a lot of them volunteer at some good nonprofit. They get involved with the community, so they service the community. But if they take hula, they can put on beautiful costumes, put flowers in their hair, lays around their neck, have a team with other women, put on a show, be glamorous, do beautiful dances. Women of a certain age can do kind of 
naughty dances. Dances with maybe double meanings. It's fun. You can be beautiful, desirable. It's very meaningful for women of a certain age, especially. Anybody can do the hula. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how fat you are, how skinny you are. Any, anybody can do the hula and have a good time doing it. It gives you something more that, that you don't get from bingo. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for that. What a wonderful thing to be doing now and to be helping people feel more confident about themselves, to feel beautiful, to be physically active. And to do it with other people, be in a community that's doing it. I think it's wonderful work you're doing. We have a sisterhood of the dancers. We've become very close. And it's really, really a wonderful thing. And it just happens. If I had set out to do that, maybe I could have and maybe I couldn't. But it just happens because of the hula. Because it's a connection. The hula has meaning. The deeper you get into it, the more you realize that it is a connection to everything. It's from the earth. It's from the planet. It comes up through your feet to you. And it's all about nature and it's connected, connectedness to all the trees, the flowers, the stars, the sky, the ocean, everything to each other. Very powerful dance. Betty Ann, is the hula an ancient dance way back in Hawaiian culture? Hula, as King Kalakaua said, is the heartbeat of the Hawaiian people. The Hawaiians have done hula forever. The hula is a human way of being a tree or a flower or communicating with what is around us in nature. That's what the hula is. People have tried to define it and understand the power of it and why everybody loves the hula. What is there about the hula that is so attractive? I think that going back to what Kalakaua said about it being the language of the heart, because it does speak to your entire self in a very profound way, very, very meaningful, not just connected to nature, but connected to each other. It's all about emotions. It's all about feelings, you know, as an interpretive dance. So every dance tells a story. Thank you, Betty Ann, for that. I appreciate that and love hearing how this is coming from your heart and how important this is to you and the work that you're doing. It sounds like it's just making a lot of people happy, including yourself. And I'm so happy about that. I wanted to finish up by talking about this book that I've mentioned a few times. It's a book called The Munchkin Diary that you very recently published. And you've told us some of the stories from that book. I know for a fact that that book is filled with so many more adventures and descriptive stories. And the whole point of this podcast is to get people to tell stories about themselves or people within their own family trees, because so many people are losing that art of storytelling of families sitting around the table and sharing about their histories, their cultures, their backgrounds. And your book does such a wonderful job of bringing you back to the time when all these interesting uncles and aunts and friends of the family, not to mention a few munchkins, were around in your life. And it paints an amazing picture of your life. And I'm so glad that you've put pen to paper and that that book has been published. And it's an amazing book. How can people get a hold of a copy of your book? They can order it on Amazon and it will be both in ebook form and in, in soft cover. Here in Sonoma, it's available at our local bookstore, and I hope it's going to be in more bookstores. We're working on that. We've just begun the marketing program recently, so I hope it will be in bookstores. The full name of it is The Munchkin Diary, My Personal Yellow Brick Road. I understand the person who wrote the forward to your book is someone who's very interesting. Could you tell us about that? Yes, Robert Baum is... L. Frank Baum's great-grandson. And of course, L. Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. I think that's the full name of his book. I met Bob at an Oz convention about 20 years ago, and we've stayed in touch. He is very involved in the Oz world and wears a costume like the wizard, and his wife Claire dresses up in Oz 
type costume. They go to a lot of Oz festivals and conventions, and he is the keeper and distributor of memorabilia that had belonged to his great-grandfather. So he has loaned a lot of his great-grandfather's things to Oz celebrations. He tells a wonderful story about his great-grandfather in the foreword. I was just so glad that he accepted our invitation to write a piece for the book because it, it enriches that whole, that whole piece. It's wonderful. Betty Ann, what inspired you to write The Munchkin Diary? I started writing it a few months after I retired from Channel 2. I wrote it for my son so that they would know, after I'm long gone, they would know what my life was like and what my world was like. It's very different from the world they grew up in. And I thought, well, they, they didn't ask me a lot of questions. They haven't. But I thought, someday they'll be curious, or maybe their children will be curious and love these stories. So that's why I wrote it. And it sat, when I turned 70, I gave them the stories in a three-hole binder with some family pictures printed out on my computer. That was my intention. I never intended it to be a public, a published book. So the stories are much more candid and honest than I ever would have written if I had had in mind strangers reading my life story. It's not an autobiography. It's just a bunch of stories that I wanted to tell my children. Stories that are important to me, are funny, sad, you know, colorful. It's about your life, and there it is documented for generations to come. Yes, yes. And it was fun writing them for my kids. So a couple years ago, some reporters kept asking me questions about hula for some stories they were doing for the local papers. I gave first the story of the who and the hula. Here's all my information about the hula. Take this, read it. Then if you have any additional questions, we can talk. Well, the reporters love the who and the hula. This is a great story. And I said, oh, yeah, well, I've written about a dozen or so stories. Really? Can I read those? Sure. And the response was, you really should publish these stories. They're great. And then along came COVID. We couldn't have hula classes anymore. No performances. We did one show last year. And that was in the park, in the plaza, around Christmas time. We danced socially, distanced, masked around the lighting of the Christmas tree by the city. So we were part of the city's program for that. That's the only thing we did all year. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about, didn't the city of Sonoma give you an award or recognition? That was an amazing honor. The city of Sonoma named me the city's treasure artist for 2020. That's an honor that they've given out for about 40 or 50 years to sculptors, painters, potters, fine artists. I never in a million years expected ever to get anything like that. It was a complete surprise. When I was in class one day last year, they sent a delegate to make the pronouncement that I had been chosen as the city's treasure artist for 2020. And then now they've extended that to 2021 because of COVID. It's amazing. And they gave me the key to the city. They had a big city party. The mayor was there, all the city council, everybody. Everybody was there. It was incredible. So that's uh, what the hula has done. So Betty Ann, what would you say you would want your legacy to be? I think there are a couple of things I would like to think that people learn from me. And one is to follow your passions, to do what you love doing, and to do it wholeheartedly. I've always felt for young people not to go after money as such, per se, for its own self. If you follow your passion, the money will somehow come. You'll be able to survive. My other legacy, my other hope is that people can live with the Aloha spirit. That's what I try to to live by in the hula. That's why I try to teach by example through hula mai and what I do. Because the Aloha spirit, the Aloha spirit is being able to give without needing or even expecting to get anything back. 
it's just freely giving what you have to share. One of the things that I like to talk about on the podcast is how people's lives are inspired by other people and you certainly inspire a lot of people. So I'm so glad that you've been able to be on our podcast, Betty Ann. And I want to really want to thank you for your time that you've spent and your husband just spending it with us and telling your story. So I want to thank you again. Well, thank you for doing this for us because we love it. It's really important to us and we love talking about it and just being it. And I just like to say that my husband, Craig Shiner, is as important to Hula Mai as the Hula is. He does all the technical stuff, the sound, the cameras, the pictures, the social media, everything. If it weren't for him and everything he does, I think nobody would know about Hula Mai except the women who are part of it. And I don't think we would have been able to find you if it weren't for him. Thank you to Craig. <laughs> Betty Ann, I hope you and Craig continue to stay healthy and let's please stay in touch so we can hear all about your next adventures. Yes, we want that too. Thank you very much, James. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. So for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.